look at the Maggotkin of Nurgle Battle Tome. Now that it's been out for a few months, uh, I've personally had a good deal of experience with it, taking it to a few events, uh, done a whole bunch of casual play with it, and uh, of course talked to a lot of other folks and seen other reviews uh, after their own experiences. So I thought we would take another look at this and um, kind of see what we uh, have going on here. Uh, this was definitely a book sort of from the beginning that a lot of us thought that it was going to require actually playing and experimenting with things to see what the actual power level was like. And that turned out to be absolutely true. A lot of the things that we sort of thought on the first read of the Battle Tome uh, ended up to not quite be right. And um, overall, I think it's a really strong book and, um, you know, uh, tournament results have definitely proven that over time. So let's dig into this bad boy. So I'm going to basically just go through, like, pretty much the original slideshow that I did for uh, the release of this Battle Tome. Um, just kind of go through everything. I'm not going to like necessarily read out everything, um, but any big highlights that come up, I think uh, we are going to discuss. Uh, coalition units, um, most of these are really not that useful. We definitely have a problem uh, that there's really no synergy with any of the coalition units. Uh, one little tech piece that I have been starting to experiment with is uh, running a Skaven Pestilence Plague Priest with the Heal Prayer. Uh, he's only 85 points, and, um, you know, you have some pretty big boys in this army that could use some additional healing, so he might uh, be worth it when you have uh, an unusual amount of points left over. Um, disgustingly resilient, fo Locus of Fecundity, I mean, th those are just really like the backbone of this army and how it functions. It makes you, you know, disgustingly resilient. All of your stuff is really hard to kill, everything heals, and in most lists, you're going to be running a Great Unclean one, or Horticulus, or the Glotkin, or Festus, so you're going to be getting a lot of D3 heals back as well. And I believe everything in the book is multi-wound, so you're always going to be able to have an opportunity to heal something. Now, the disease battle trait, this is another huge thing in this army. This is one of the things that... Yeah, we couldn't really tell at the outset how valuable this was going to be. Um, you know, it, if uh, you roll a six to hit on anything, it does disease. There's spells that do disease. Being in combat with things uh, spreads disease. And um, it's pretty hard to get rid of these disease tokens. And after, you know, you roll in the battle shock phase, it's always going to leave that residual one disease left over. So if you're able to get disease onto things sort of in the backfield, um, Gift of Contagion is, you know, a surprisingly good spell because you can drop uh, disease on enemy units that are 21 inches away. So that really can get disease onto things pretty far away. And then you have a lot of opportunities, you know, with that one disease point that sticks around, just rolling every turn to really sort of whittle things down weaken things, pick a couple of models up, maybe kill a hero. Um, over time, it definitely has a lot of value. And it's certainly, you know, when you're just in battle with things, like it is a whole bunch of extra damage that all of your units are doing. So disease is really strong. Um, of course, it's a little bit swingy. Um, we do have a couple of things that improve it. We have one of the spots on the wheel gives you plus one to disease rolls, and the Wither Stave artifact gives you plus one to disease rolls around that particular hero. So um, the reliability can be improved. And, um, you know, of course, the more disease you throw on something, the, the more effective and 
it's going to be, the more reliable those roles are going to be. It, it can be surprisingly powerful. And because it's doing mortal wounds, you know, it's going right through armor, and there's not a lot your opponent can do about it a lot of times. All right, sub-factions. This is one of those places where things were different than we really thought they were initially going to be. Uh, munific munificent Wanderers, I haven't seen too many people actually using this. This seems to be like the one that you go to if you are running a lot of plague bearers and not a lot of other things and the other sub factions aren't really doing anything for you befouling host this one is like the big surprise i think out of all of the sub factions i think a lot of us sort of wrote it off initially but you know at the start of the game, you get a second Feculent Gnarl Maw, so that is an additional um, Contagion point every turn. Beasts of Nurgle become Battle Line, and Beasts of Nurgle are very good. Like, they're a lot stronger than we had anticipated. And we'll talk a little bit more about Beasts of Nurgle when we get there, um, when we're looking at the War Scrolls, but... In addition to that, then you also have Horticula Slimux, who buffs Beasts of Nurgle and gives you a third Feculent Gnarl Maw. So you're getting a decent amount of additional Contagion points out of this. Uh, and then a lot of folks have been uh, adding on to this um, a, you know, a great unclean one with a bell to get even more Contagion points for summoning. Because, uh, you know... Beasts of Nurgle are a great option to summon, and they're not that expensive. Uh, Droning Guard, I think this has probably been the most lackluster of all of the ones that we have so far. Um, you know, it really is just like, it's effective in the first battle round, and I think that's kind of the problem. If it was, you know, if it was like this the whole game, like minus one to hit on all of your drones for the whole game, like that would be a good sub faction. But, um, you know, particularly because drones are a little bit fragile, but only in the first battle round, really, they're not going to get targeted much. They're not going to be completing that many charges. So th this is really a tough one to justify. I think this one is kind of a dud. Over to the mortal side, the Blessed Sons, this sort of has the same place as uh, the Munificent Wanderers, although it's better than the Munificent Wanderers. Um, you know, basically all of your uh, mortals, when they die, they explode, and, you know, for each wound that the model has, you roll a die, each six does one disease, so you know, you're potentially putting some extra mortal wounds on your opponent when they kill your stuff. Um, it's kind of a default. It's not really a an exceptionally strong one. Like you don't really build around this, um, but it, it's not that it's bad. Like it's a useful ability if you are, you know, leaning into mortals and the other things don't really apply. Uh, Drowned Men, this one is actually really good. This has been seeing a lot of play. Um, yeah, that pregame move that you get with the Lord of Afflictions and Pasquale of Light Lords, that's incredibly powerful. I've used that quite a bit. Um, making Pasquale of Light Lords battle line, I mean, it, a lot of stuff in this army is battle line anyway, so it's not that big of a deal, but it doesn't hurt. Um, and, you know, if you're playing match play, uh, it adds on to that uh, number of battle line units for a grand strategy or for um, battle tactics. And we'll see, you know, with the next General's Handbook, what uh, effect that's going to have on this as well. If, you know, if battle line troops are going to be somehow impacted by that. Filthbringers, this is a really interesting one. This uh, went four and one at uh, Adepticon. So, you know, you take a group of three Rotbringer Sorcerers and, you know, you keep them all close together and one of your casts per turn is at plus three, basically. So this is your option 
to give you a really strong caster in your army. Um, this combined with the Rotbringer Sorcerer's ability to disease um, endless spells makes it extra powerful. You can throw endless spells out at your opponent and spread disease into their backfields and you know do more damage that way. Uh, the Shards of Valagar are one of the primo picks for this that a, a lot of folks have been going to to uh, you know have a strong ability and really get in there and be um, touching a lot of enemy models to spread disease. All right, Cycle of Corruption. Um, you know everything on this is basically what we initially thought. Uh, Magikin Heroes getting a 4-up ward that's strong but not gain-breaking. Um, all units treated as being within a locus of fecundity. Um, this really depends on what your list composition is. This could either be really strong or be completely redundant with all of your other loci of fecundity that you already have. Um, uh, gaining extra contagion points, again, kind of weak. Um, Non-Nurgle heroes can't carry out heroic actions or use Rally or Inspiring Presence. That is very, very strong, and a lot of people really get messed up by that. Uh, enemy units are minus one to charge and cannot pile in. Um, very powerful, plus one to disease rolls, also very powerful, and getting a contagion point for each Feculent Gnarl Maw you have. I mean, it's okay in the Fouling Host when you're building around that, but otherwise that's just going to give you one Contagion point, and that's not too exciting. All right, Summoning. Uh, this army tends to not actually do a ton of summoning. You're maybe going to summon something once or twice uh, during the game. I have been seeing people uh, run Nurglings in their army to throw on the opposite side of the battlefield to get that extra uh, three Contagion per turn. Um, I'm not sure how worth it that actually is. Um, although Nurglings have been proving to be surprisingly strong. So they could also kind of get into your enemy lines and then kind of tie up some enemy units in their backfield and just generally be annoying while giving you contagion points. Uh, going down this list, uh, things that definitely pop up most commonly, uh, summoning plague bearers, that happens a lot. Uh, summoning plague drones, um, that's kind of like one of your offensive options if you're looking for some extra offensive push. Uh, but getting up to 18 contagion points sometimes can be a bit of a challenge. Um, Beasts of Nurgle coming out for 10 contagion points, that's really strong. Um, that definitely happens a lot. The Feculent Gnarl Maw, the math just doesn't work out on that. So I think the only real reason you would... Uh, summon a feculent gnarl maw is to be a locust to summon other things. Um, nurglings, as we've mentioned before, they're just kind of there. They're they get in the way. They're a bit better than we all kind of thought they were, um, but they're not necessarily superstars. They're good to kind of bog down your opponent, and they're really inexpensive at eight contagion points. Sloppity Bile Piper and Spoil Pox Scrivener. These are very common to get summoned, particularly the Sloppity Bile Piper, because he can buff all of your demons. Um, he is often the first thing to get summoned in a lot of in a lot of armies. Command traits. Um, so these are the mortal command traits, and. What this has really come down to is most of these are not that good. And the most common one that you're going to see is Overwhelming Stench. Um, you know, preventing your enemy from issuing and receiving commands is a big deal. Uh, the problem is, is that the best thing to throw this on is a Lord of Afflictions. And he's... 
you know, he's a three up, five up, so he's pretty durable, but um, he only has eight wounds, so he's certainly not going to last forever. And with only a seven inch radius, you kind of need to get him into combat. So he's really at risk when you're doing that. And he also has to be your general, which, you know, you can take away from some other uh, potential options. Over on the demon side, uh, Nurgling Infestation is really strong. You know, it just, usually this is going on a great unclean one, and it's just giving everything minus one to hit the great unclean one. Um and uh, just making him even more durable than he already is. Um, the other two, really not that exciting. Over to artifacts. Um, again, I think the artifacts and command traits in this book are really the weak point, but I, I feel like the book needed something somewhere that wasn't that strong. Right, like there's a few here that are worthwhile, but you know, like on this whole page of mortal artifacts, there's basically nothing worth really taking, except if you're kind of going for like a Timmy sort of build. Um, you know, Eye of Nurgle can be fun to you know blow up an enemy model, um, you know, particularly if that's like a Mega Gargant or something like that. Um, The one that I think is most commonly going to be taken out of Mortal Artifacts is the Splithorn Helm, uh, improving your ward save on the bearer to 4+. Um, you know, again, if you're going with the Lord of Afflictions as your general and uh, you're throwing Overwhelming Stench on him, giving him the Splithorn Helm makes him more durable, so you get that uh, command trait effectiveness for longer um the rust fang i think is also not terrible um it can only target enemy heroes now but you know the old it looks on paper like it's a lot worse than the old version of the rust fang but in actuality you never really ever stabbed that many things with it to begin with so i think this is not that big of a downgrade um, other than that, on the, the artifact side for mortals, I mean, I actually find myself taking, uh, Arcane Tome fairly frequently, uh, to give, uh, somebody the, uh, gift of disease, particularly doing it on a, um, Lord of Afflictions, give him gift of disease, and then run it in drowned men so you get that pre-game move that gets you in range of gift of disease to hit your opponent's lines on the top of turn one and get a bunch of disease spread around um my record so far is uh using that little combo to get disease onto 12 enemy units in uh one casting of gift of disease so uh it can be pretty powerful Demon artifacts, again, we really have pretty much the same problem here. There's some things that are more fun that you could use. Um, the most useful here is really the Wither Stave that's adding one to disease rolls. Very commonly, that's going on a great unclean one. So, you know, they're host of nurglings doing 15 attacks is going to generate a lot of disease and then your disease rolls are improved so it's overall adding to the damage that your great unclean one can do uh spells on the mortal side i mean it, there's some challenges here you know blades of putrefaction is okay but it goes off on a seven. Um, Gift of Disease is usually the one I pick. Um, I'm not sure what you do in a situation where you know you're running like Rock Coven and you have to pick three of these spells to give to wizards. Um, you know, it, it, it's it, yeah, Magnificent Bubos is pretty good too. 
there's some options in here. It, the problem is, is that like almost all of these are casting value seven. Um, and without having a lot of things in here that are um, buffing your casting, it makes it really unreliable to cast spells. And there's a lot of uh, other armies out there that can dispel you with uh, bonuses or do auto dispels. So it really um, becomes a problem. It, it, like ca spell casting is kind of like a nice to have in this army rather than something that you build around. Over on the demon side, I mean, again, these are not super powerful. Um, honestly, like if I'm taking a great unclean one, I'm probably actually taking flaming weapon on him to make him more powerful in combat. Um, Fleshy Abundance is good if you're running a whole bunch of Plague Bearers, then they become even more of a quagmire for your opponent to deal with. Um, favored Poxes is a little bit of a challenge because it's a really powerful effect, but it ends as soon as the caster moves, attacks, attempts to cast or unbind, or is slain. So you probably want to throw that on a Poxbringer who is going to be hard to get within 14 inches of the enemy. So, and then again, you have to deal with casting value seven and that's tough. So demon spells, I think are definitely a little bit lackluster. All right, on to the good stuff. All of the war scrolls in this book. Unfortunately, we're starting off with Rodigus, who is one of the weaker war scrolls in the book, although he's not bad. Um, he's very durable. Yeah, he he's in combat. He's really not quite worth his points. Um, his spell is good, and you do get a reroll on that spell, so you do have you know that extra ability to deal out mortal wounds with him um you know his uh mountains of loathsome flesh is incredibly powerful you know the regular great unclean ones have that as well and the um the glot can have an improved version of that so getting into combat and just doing like an improved stomp is really good especially when you you know you can use multiple monsters you can use mountains of loathsome flesh and a stomp because it's not the same ability although it has a very similar effect uh great unclean ones um you know in general originally i thought these were really overpriced uh and you know they still might be a little bit over costed but they're definitely more powerful i think than we had originally realized um you know the build with the bile sword and plague flail does a ton of damage especially if you give him flaming weapon to add additional damage on there his shooting attack the noxious bile um rend three damage two is no joke that really can do a tremendous amount of damage the host of nurglings does a crazy number of attacks it's not there to do damage it's there to spread disease and very commonly again you're gonna run this guy with a wither stave on him so your uh, disease rolls will be on a three up so that's really good again mountains of loathsome flesh is really good uh, his spell, Plague Wind, is just terrible. I mean, I've casted it a couple of times just because I had nothing else to cast. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, uh, some people have been running him with the Doomsday Bell to get extra Contagion points. And... You know, his damage profile on the Doomsday Bell is, like, not terrible. You know, it definitely makes it so that he's not really a hammer as much anymore, but he can still do some damage. So, I don't know. It's a trade-off. I personally prefer the Sword and Flail right now. Um, 
I'm not really sure why anybody would run, be running the Bile Blade right now. Uh, definitely not strong. Um, you know, so Bell and Flail might be an option. I don't currently have, you know, that version built anywhere. So um, I really haven't had a chance to experiment with it. But definitely run the Great Unclean one a bunch of times, and he's real good. Horticulus Slimux. This guy is really interesting because he's adding one to hit rolls for all of your beasts of Nurgle wholly within 14 inches of him. And you can re-roll their charges. 14 inches is a big bubble. So that is definitely very strong. This guy is not that great in combat. Um but he is also a locus of fecundity he's pretty durable and you know he gets you an additional feculent normal maw he's only 225 points so he's really affordable now as well so you know in the following host builds he's actually a thing that comes up really commonly because he gets you that extra summoning point every turn and he's buffing your beasts of nurgle that are battle line and they're a lot better than we originally had thought they would be, and he's giving them all plus one to hit, which just makes them even better. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, you know, this has been kind of a surprise hit. He's been coming out in a lot more lists than I think we ever had anticipated that he would. Um, and he's an awesome model, so I'm really glad to see that he's been getting some play. Epidemus is an interesting one. He he really is mainly buffing your casting, um, and there's not a lot of like really strong power in your casting. Of course, my dog is going to bark and interrupt us for a minute, um, but that's okay. We don't need to restart the recording or anything. We're pretty casual here. It's just how it goes. Um, so yeah, I mean, Epidemus, I have seen people throw him in lists occasionally. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting ability. I don't think he's useless. Um, he's only 145 points, too, so uh, he's not costing you a lot in there. So uh, it, there's definitely some play here, I think, but... Um, he's kind of, I think, part of like a build around kind of strategy. If you're going for something that is, um, uh, you know, more magic oriented, maybe if you're running a rock coven list, um, he might be useful there. All right. The Poxbringer Herald of Nurgle. Um, I mean, he's just your average foot dork, um, that casts spells. His spell isn't like that great. Um, but I mean, the main thing that he is, like he's not really that good competitively, but what he really does is he gives you access to the demon spell lore for cheap, right? He's 145 points and the model itself is inexpensive to buy. So for newer players, definitely accessible so that, you know, they can pick it up and use the demon spell lore, you know, even though they don't have a great unclean one, which is your only other demon wizard. Um, you know, he's one of those things, he's not that competitive, but, you know, he has that function. And I think we see that throughout this book that, um, every war scroll in this book has a function and a place, and almost all of them are actually good and solid and will show up in competitive lists. And those few that don't, I think just, they still have a place, but it's just not necessarily in a competitive list. Um, another good place for this guy could be in, uh, Path to Glory, because a lot of times in Path to Glory, you are playing lower point lists, so 145 points getting you a caster is pretty cheap. All right, Spoilpox Scrivener. 
I mean, he's a little bit different than his previous incarnation. And the big drawback here is that he is only buffing plague bearers. Now, he can make those plague bearers an incredible tar pit um, by, you know, giving them plus one to save. That's really good. You know, adding one to their attacks characteristic, not that exciting because it, you just can't get enough of them into combat to make that meaningful. Like, you can't even get that to make putting disease on stuff meaningful. So I think he's a little bit, he's, a, again, a little bit lackluster. One of the things that I think has kind of fallen from grace from its previous incarnation more so because of the change to Munificent Wanderers and, you know, Plague Bearers not getting improved offensively. Um, so I think those are the big things there. Sloppity Bile Piper, this guy is still uh, quite good. Um, you know, his ability to prevent pile-ins is really strong. Um, Adding one to wound rolls for friendly demon units within 14 inches of him is also really good. Um, again, one of the places you see him a lot is with befouling host lists. He does a great job of buffing up your beasts of Nurgle. This is a theme that's going to pop up over and over again. So basically... You know, you can give that your Beasts of Nurgle plus one to wound. That makes them stronger in combat, and that also synergizes well with Horticulus Slimux, giving them plus one to hit. And then you can also have the ability to uh, prevent your opponent from piling into them. Uh, and because they're on a small base, they can kind of tag the corner of a unit, and Sloppity can fart on them, and... Uh, really just tie up enemy units in combat in a way that isn't going to um, get your Beast of Nurgle killed. So, you know, you're doing damage to them, they can't really do damage back to you, and you're really tying them up. So it's a good little combo. Um, if you can't tell, I really like this list. I haven't actually been able to put it on the table yet. Uh, because I just don't own the Beasts of Nurgle. I'm working on it. I'm up to four. I need to get more. Um, but yeah, in general, really cool list. Um, Sloppity Wild Piper, as always, really good. Um, you know, and these abilities also work well with your other demons in general. Like, his gut pipes affect all friendly Nurgle demon units. So, all of this... Um, certainly does synergize well with a lot of your army. Um, and he's only 130 points, so he slides in there pretty well. And the big thing is you might not necessarily see him in a lot of lists, but he pops up on the table a lot because he only costs seven contagion points to summon. So a lot of folks will run sloppity bile piper and then just immediately you know with a befouling host list you can summon a sloppity bile piper turn one um so it's basically getting a free sloppity bile piper what can i say <laughs> um so uh it, he is definitely very good if you're leaning into demons um if you're not playing in a heavy demon strategy he's not really that powerful um he's definitely not good at holding on to artifacts or anything like that um because he's definitely not that durable but overall uh definitely a good piece to have in your army the glotkin now these guys at 700 points i had initially thought no way way too expensive not gonna cut it very good war scroll but not worth 700 points and i am here today to tell you guys that i was absolutely wrong these guys are definitely worth 700 points they basically charge in and delete anything they touch 
And when you're in a situation where you're not getting them in combat, they're this huge, like, zone area denial for your opponent where they just want to stay the hell away from him because they know he's going to delete whatever they're going to touch. And so, you know, it, it kind of gives you some free objectives to sit on. It, it gives you like a section of the board that you kind of own. Um, and for 700 points, that's definitely really worth it. Um, is extremely durable. Um, his spell's not that useful. Uh, you know, him being a wizard in general is not that useful. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely still good. Um, Mountains of Loathsome Flesh doing five mortal wounds on a two up when you're in combat. I mean, that's just a fantastic monstrous action. Um, you know, uh, there's not much else to say about these guys. I, I, I think the big thing is that they were underestimated when we first looked at this battle tome and after playing it, like absolutely worth 700 points. Would I hate it if they went down? Uh, no. Uh, could they maybe come down a little bit? Yeah. Um, they're definitely not worth more than 700 points, but, um, they're real good. All right. Festus, the leech Lord. Um, he's a little bit of a challenge. Um, he's got the locus of fecundity and he also has his, uh, delightful bruise. Uh, so he can do a lot of healing for you and that can be good, but he only moves four inches. So he, you know, his delightful bruise, it's going to be a little bit difficult to actually get them there because it has to be a unit within an inch of him. Um, his spell is very strong, but again, it goes off on a seven. So that is definitely a challenge. Um, he definitely has popped up in lists. Um, you know, if you can get that spell off, it's no joke. And, you know, being, I think the cheapest locus of fecundity is definitely strong. Like he helps heal your army and, you know, durability is the name of the game with Nurgle. So, you know, having him, you know, being around to be that cheap source of healing D3 instead of one every turn is really good. All right. Gut rot spume. I mean, what can we say? He, he can just co come in off the board edge with, you know, other uh, mortal maggot kin units. Um, I think he's slightly less useful than he used to be just because Blight Kings don't have their plus one to charge anymore. So you, you know, you have to bring the stuff in and then actually roll a nine to complete the charge. Um, but that doesn't mean he's bad. Like, it's still a good ability yeah, you know, those, those sort of deep strike abilities are really good. Putting stuff in your opponent's backfield is always threatening. Um, so even if you're not necessarily making that charge right away, it's still going to be a threat to your opponent. They're probably either going to come after them or run away. In you know, if they're running away, they're probably running away from something important as well. So he's definitely i think still a strong piece i 170 points may actually be a little pricey for him he might need to come down a little bit i haven't seen him in too many lists but um i have heard hilarious stories you know because it it's any mortal maggotkin that he can bring with him now uh definitely have heard of him coming on with the glotkin and um the other advantage to that you know with the glotkin in particular is that you are keeping you know a key unit an expensive unit off the board um in the first turn so in a lot of those like alpha shooting armies that are going to target your big stuff and try and take it off the board turn one well you're kind of taking a turn away from them that they have that possibility to shoot at you so it it does have some play there and 
you know, the Glockkin is usually not something that you're going to get into your opponent turn one anyway. So then putting him in your opponent's backfield is definitely strong. Blowab Rot Spawned, I mean, I think there's not much more to say about this guy than we said in the initial review. Um, he's good. He's pretty strong in combat. Out of the three Magath Lords, he's the least durable, but he does get a plus one to cast, which is nice. It, it makes that mortal spell lore more accessible. Um, his spell is definitely pretty good. You can end up getting a lot of extra d3 mortal wounds out of him um so you know he, he's solid he's been showing up in a lot of lists people have been having a lot of success with him um not my personal favorite of the three magath lords but i think he's worth every penny at 300 points morbidex twice born um he is probably you know the least favored of all of the Magath Lords, although I think I think he's got some play. And let just hear me out for a minute. First of all, he's healing half of his wounds at the end of every battle shock phase. So he is very, very durable at 12 wounds with a three up save and a five up ward. And then if you have, you know, if you're within a locus of fecundity, then he's healing another D3. If he's not in combat, he's got bravery nine, so you can use heroic recovery for another D3. Um, and, you know, Nerglings are also surprisingly powerful. So his ability to throw another slain Nurgling model back into a unit um, can actually be pretty useful if you're running a couple of different groups of Nurglings, um, just kind of like running them close to each other on the battlefield. Um, and he's, you know, he's not as strong as Orgots in battle, but he's pretty close. Um, so he's really more of the anvil of all of these, but I mean, you know, Orgots is definitely really hard to kill as well. Is he worth more points than the other two? I don't think so, but, you know, he's still good. Um, he's still a good choice. I think messing around with the Nurgling stuff is something that people haven't really done yet and I think has potential. Uh, Orgot's Demon Spew, definitely my favorite out of the three Magath Lords. 14 wounds with a three up save. He has an absolutely killer melee profile, and um, he gives you basically a free command point every turn. Um, and he bounces back mortal wounds uh, when he saves with his ward save. So, I mean, and he's a war master, so he is always treated as your general. Um, he's really good. I, I, I don't know what to say. Like, he goes in a lot of my lists. A lot. He does a lot of murdering. And, you know, we're coming up on what appears to be, um, you know, maybe a horde meta, maybe just a, a more infantry-focused meta. And this guy just absolutely tears through foot troops. Like you would not believe um i have had him take out 20 clan rats in one combat phase before um a whole bunch of other similar circumstances to that where you know he's just slamming through uh enemy units so very strong uh fecula fly blown and the worm spat um Fecula is basically the same as a Rotbringer Sorcerer, and the Worm Spat is basically two of your Blight King leader models. Um, you know, she's a little bit of a challenge. I think she's one of the War Scrolls in this book that's not quite as good, but, you know, it's a Warcry Warband. Like, what are you going to do, right? Like, there's they can't make all of these great. Um, 
you know, her ability to bodyguard onto these guys, I think, is really good. Um, the problem is, like, what spells do you give her? Um, you probably want her casting endless spells because she does have that tainted endless spells ability, just like the Rotbringer sorcerers do. So I'm not 100% sure on what her place is, um, but she sure is cool. I'm not going to say no to that. Like, it, you know, the models are great. They're cool. Um, they're good. Like, you know, if you're coming over, you were playing, um, I'm sorry, not Warcry, Underworlds. They're, if you were playing Underworlds um, and you're coming over to Age of Sigmar and you have this warband, it's, you know, it's 255 points start to your army. Um, you know, that's getting you a wizard and a couple of troops that are going to hit pretty hard. So, you know, not terrible. Um, definitely has a place. Um, I'm not sure that place is in competitive play, but it's a place. Harbinger of Decay. Um, I've been pondering with Harbinger of Decay because he has an ability that's basically roar. And then, of course, you have a whole bunch of monsters in this book who also can roar. And then you have... Uh, overwhelming stench which also prevents command abilities being used and then you could take geminids to shut down more command abilities so i think there's really a build in this book where you just shut down your opponent's ability to use command points and uh you know the harbinger of decay is certainly a part of that um he's fairly durable he's not doing a ton of damage um he can give you some extra command points in the first battle round um you know he's one of those guys that like he's an inexpensive unit to throw in your army to be your general if you're running mortal stuff the model is not that expensive to buy um and in terms of points he's not that expensive so i think he really has a role in you know that corner case weird build as well as you know being uh, a good general for path to glory or you know being an accessible general or accessible hero for new players playing at lower point levels Lord of Afflictions, uh, this guy is fantastic. He's my general a lot. He can definitely dish out a decent amount of damage. He lets you deep strike your Puscoil Blight Lords and Plague Drones. He does impact hits when he charges. Um, you know, he's very durable with a 3-up save and 8 wounds. So, I mean, this guy is just good. He just pops up in a lot of lists, and um, he's he moves eight inches and flies, so he's really good at carrying overwhelming stench and bringing that into your opponent's lines. Um, and he's only 210 points. Like, he's still a, a pretty points-effective buy. So I like him a lot, and uh, a lot of other people like him a lot. He shows up in a lot of lists. Um, he's really good not i think we all identified him as being really good when this book launched and we have all been proven right lord of blights so i'm gonna be honest like our initial read on this that he wasn't that strong is definitely correct um but he again is one of those models that like although he's really not good competitively he does have a place like he's a good um you know mortal general for a new player the model is inexpensive to buy he's only 150 points and if you're looking at playing path to glory he's an inexpensive general um or an inexpensive hero to start off with um you know he's a three up save with seven wounds so if you throw overwhelming stench on him in a uh, uh a path to glory warband you know he's a lot cheaper than a lord of afflictions and he's almost as durable as a lord of afflictions so 
Um, he certainly has a place. It's like not a crazy great place, but it um, is certainly, you know, there's things you can do with him. Like he's going to show up on the table. Lord of Plagues, almost the exact same deal as Lord of Blights. You know, he's not great competitively, but, you know, he's good for new players. He's good for Path to Glory. Um, you know, he, he's got some solid abilities. Um, you know, buffing up Blight Kings is pretty good. Like, especially in uh, Path to Glory, getting that extra buff is really strong. Um, when you might not have access to a ton of units, like that buff is increasing like a higher percentage of your overall output. So, you know, not really exciting competitively, but has some point purpose to his existence and only 145 points. So definitely a good buy. And, you know, as with Lord of Blights and some other things that we've mentioned, inexpensive model for new players to buy that is useful on the tabletop. It's not great, but, you know, a new player is going to get use out of it. Rotbringer Sorcerers. I mean, these are just your average, uh, you know, mortal spellcasting dorks. Um, they taint endless spells. They have a mediocre spell. The real strength here is building them into rot covens and, you know, getting that big bonus to cast and throwing out your endless spells at your opponent and um, kind of mucking things up that way. Um, it, it can definitely be really strong. Uh, I don't see them very frequently getting taken in lists outside of rot covens. Um, again, though, when we're looking at this from a perspective other than, you know, competitive match play, this is a way that is cheap both in points and in dollars it, to get access to the mortal spell lore. Um, all of your other mortal wizards are high points and expensive models, so... You know, for a newer player or for Path to Glory, he's going to be a good cheap wizard to grab. Uh, so he has a function, but it's not necessarily like the most exciting function. Uh, good for new players, good for Path to Glory, not that exciting for, uh, you know, your competitive match play. Plague Bearers. Um, I think people were pretty high on these guys when they when the book first came out and i've been seeing them like less and less frequently in lists like you know maybe they're like one unit of 10 of them um there is you know you're not seeing hordes of these you're they're just kind of like they're a tar pit they're filling battle line they're not super exciting like they just you know they only do one attack each they're more of a tar pit than anything else they're on 32 millimeter bases so they're they're not getting a lot of attacks in um yeah it, it there's just not really a lot there they mainly sit on objectives and get in the way that's their main role that they really have uh, Plague Drones, these guys I think could get better if we move to a meta where there is uh, higher numbers of infantry because of their death's head attacks, um, because that is dependent on the number of enemy units uh, within range of the attack. So if we're getting a horde meta where you can get a whole bunch of models within 7 inches of them before they charge, then they can do a lot of damage. At the moment, they're not as good. They're not as durable or as punchy as Pusquail Blight Lords in the current meta. But, you know, it's not that they're bad. Like, they're still good. It's not... I, I think people just prefer the Pusquail Blight Lords because they're also two models instead of three, so you're more likely to get that 
like concentration of damage getting all of that in in one place all right beasts of nurgle the surprise hero of this book so they synergize really well with other stuff that goes on in this book they work well with the following host they become battle line they're uh buffed by horticulus slimux who is a locus of fecundity who heals them they have eight wounds so they can take a bit of a punch and they're on a small base so it's hard for your opponent to get lots of attacks in on them so they become surprisingly durable and then horticulus is healing them Horticulus is also buffing their offense, and then you have Sloppity Bile Piper that could also be buffing their offense or preventing your opponent from piling into them, uh, which makes them more defensive and tar pity. Um, so, like, these guys are like the surprise hit of the book. Um, they're really cheap at 110 points when they charge in. Um, you know, on a two up, they do D3 mortal wounds. Their attack profile, like for 110 points is not bad, especially when they're getting buffed by, you know, Horticulus Slimux and Sloppity Vile Piper. Um, yeah, and they can run in charge. They can retreat in charge. When they retreat on a four up, it gives your opponent disease. I mean, it, these guys are like, on like the initial read you're like uh it's 110 points for a single model that it, you know it's like kind of like compared to chariots is what i i kind of feel like these guys were but like with the synergies in the book and just kind of how they work they're surprisingly good like and people have been doing really well at tournaments with them and the fun thing about this too is that because they're inexpensive they scale down well for uh like path to glory games um you know you can run beasts of nurgle horticulus slimux and sloppity pile piper and like bam there is your uh you know your warband for path to glory um the downside of this is that these are like fifty dollars per model um like they're expensive and you know there's a lot of third party options and 3d print options out there that people have been taking advantage of personally i mean i just like this model kit um you know when i built my first one a while ago because i i for a long time i only had one um I wasn't really paying that close of attention to the options in the box. Um, but with all of the different bits options and the different, um, all of the different things that have multiple different bits options, there's like about 150 different ways you can actually build these guys, which is I mean it's just kind of cool right like you can have a whole horde of these guys and they all look a little bit different um and there's you know some places on each of them where you know you kind of have some flexibility and options to even take it a step further to make you know their hair a little bit unique or something like that so um they're cool models i, I think the only downside is that like on the financial side they're 50 bucks each so uh scoop them up if you can um you know and 30 don't be afraid of third party sculpts don't be afraid of um 3d printing and uh the other thing that a lot of people have been doing is uh demon plague toads of nurgle from forge world i believe those are actually still available in the forge world store um, and they're on the same size base and they look like beasts of Nurgle and I believe they are not legal in match play. So they are just fine to use as beasts of Nurgle. A lot of people use them. Um, and 
I think the pricing actually comes out to less per model if you're using the Demon Plague Totes. Huh. So that's a lot on Beasts of Nurgle. It, it, they're, again, they're the su surprise MVPs of this book. I don't think many people saw them coming as being really good and then a couple of people caught on to it and did well at tournaments and now they're like the thing uh nerdlings these guys are also surprisingly good um they never had a ward save before and they have a ward save now and that makes a huge difference you get three models that are four wounds each with a five up ward save and if one of the models in the unit has wounds on it in the battle shock phase, um, it heals all of the wounds back. So these guys are really difficult to get rid of. And they're throwing five attacks each. So, you know, a unit of three is throwing 15 attacks. Now, all of those attacks are crappy at fives and fives, but they're spreading a lot of disease. And that's really the key here. That's where they're really doing damage. Um, are they going to like do enough damage to really kill something? No, but they're going to get something into combat, whittle something down, and be a bit of a tar pit and hard to get away from. Um, they also uh, can deep strike and you know pop up in your opponent's territory so that you get extra contagion points which is a really common thing to do with them uh, they're real good for that uh, very useful um you know i used to think of it you know just in the strict math terms that like oh you're buying this unit of nerdlings to throw on the other side of the battlefield to sit there and accumulate contagion points for you and you know what's the math of like what contagion points you're getting out of it compared to what they're worth and you know how many contagion points they are to summon them and the fact that like now they're actually useful it makes a big difference that you're you're throwing them over there and they're not just you know they're not just bench sitters they're actually having a function and doing something in addition to getting you those additional contagion points so these guys are really interesting they're fun little tar pits um i think the biggest downside of these guys is that there's no way to make them battle line if say if they were battle line if you had morbidex in your army i think that would be a flavorful way to um make them battle line and make sense um but you know you can only make so much stuff battle line um but the fact that they're not makes them kind of a, it's it's hard to justify them in your army beyond like one or two units of them all right putrid blight kings um these guys are absolute destruction machines and we all initially looked at this and said 250 points holy crap that's really expensive um they couldn't possibly be worth that much and we were all wrong they are very very good um again the downside on these guys is that they only move four inches and that's basically the problem that you have throughout the whole book is that everything only moves four inches with a couple of exceptions um but you know that basically just means they can't like alpha strike your opponent they're going to be getting into combat in the second battle round like most of the time because your opponent's going to come for you as well um so I mean, these guys are just really good. They punch really hard. They're extremely durable. They hand out tons of disease. Relentless Attackers is a great ability, and it is going to get even better if um, 
you know, if Horde meta becomes a thing. And yeah, I love them. They're in almost every one of my lists. They're great. And then finally, Puskoil Blight Lords. Um, these guys are basically Blight Kings on flies. Um, they do a whole bunch of damage as well. Again, very durable. Um, Rack and Ruin does a lot more damage than you would expect. So when these guys charge in, they are doing a lot of damage. They also have Relentless Attackers, but because there's fewer models in the unit, they're not doing as much. Um, but they move 8 inches and fly, and with Droning Guard, they can get a pregame move. Or with um, the Lord of Afflictions, they can Deep Strike. So there's definitely some good options here. Um, these guys are fantastic. Again, a unit that is in almost every list that I build. Um they're just really strong. I think they're even stronger than we thought when we initially reviewed this book. Um, there have definitely been lists that are just Puscoil Blight Lords and Wards of Afflictions and uh, put it in Droning Guard and one drop it and rush it all at your enemy on turn one. Um, so it they're interesting. I don't know what to say about that. All right, so in conclusion, um, most of our initial thoughts on unit pricing were probably wrong. Um, a lot of the things that we thought were overpriced are definitely a lot more fairly priced than we realized. Um, the internal balance in this book is absolutely fantastic. Every war scroll has a purpose and function in the book. Everything in the book is really flavored very well to being Nurgle-y. It all feels like Nurgle. It, you know, it's slow, it's resilient, it hits hard, it does diseasey things. Um, Orgots and Bloab, definitely MVPs of the army. Glotkin and Great Unclean Ones are better than we expected and are showing up in, you know, one of those two are in almost every list that you see competitively. Beasts of Nurgle are just like, you know, I, I've been talking about them over and over again throughout this video. I don't know how many times in this video I have said Beast of Nurgle, um, but they are just a surprise hit. I, I don't know what to say about that, but like they're surprisingly good and unfortunately i haven't really found too many battle reports out there that use the befouling host list so that people can see how it works um i've had people describe to me how it plays pretty well um so i think i understand how it works but um you know, I wish I could direct you guys to a battle report so you could see how it actually works. Um, there's a bunch of different viable builds in this army. Um, like, it, I, I have seen, you know, the Befouling Host list work well. I have seen lists with the Glotkin and a whole bunch of mortals. I've seen Rotcoven. I've seen, um, you know, Oopsel plus coils, um, you know, things that are just kind of like balanced lists, you, you know, uh, great unclean ones, um, you know, little bits of everything. Uh, Nurglings, again, probably useful. Um, overall, like the army is really strong, but fair. It definitely has potential to go 5-0 uh, at big tournaments. It has done that numerous times. Um, a lot of 4-1s as well. Um, it's a good book. Um, I think it's very new player friendly in terms of gameplay. There's not a million rules to remember. Um, you know, you can kind of play a lot of the same unit so you don't have that information overload and still have a, a decent list. Um, and like they're strong without having to think that hard about it, which I think is very new player friendly. 
Um, but of course, like any army, they're much better in the hands of a better, more experienced player. So, you know, the power level definitely scales up well. It's just starting at a good place for newer players. Um, I think this is actually a good army for new players to start with. Like, plus the models are cool. Um, you know, it, there's some issues right now with the cost of the army and with the Magath Lords, it's like model availability. Like every time those things come back in stock within like a day or two, they're out of stock again. Um, they just sell right out immediately because they're really good and more than one of the builds is good and out of one kit. So people are just scooping them up. Um, I haven't seen uh, problems with Beasts of Nurgle yet, but I mean, once that hot tech becomes uh, really popular, I mean, you're probably going to get shortages of Beasts of Nurgle as well. Um, you know, it, it's a good book. Um, it's a little expensive sometimes. Um, it's more expensive for a guy like me that I think I'm almost at 10,000 points and all painted, by the way. Um, I have very little that is not painted uh, out of this army. So it's really fun. I love this book in like every way. I think the only slight disappointments out of the whole thing are really like the like command traits, artifacts and spells like those are a little bit lackluster the excellence of all of the rest of the book i think makes up for it and really like if all of this had really good command traits and artifacts and spells on top of all of the other stuff being good i think it would be a little bit overpowered so i think it it leaves this in a really good balanced place um so yeah that's it guys Hey, I made a video for the first time in a while, like a real one. So don't forget to do all the like and subscribe stuff, which, um, you know, I probably should have mentioned earlier because almost nobody is going to be listening at this point. Anyway, I'll see you all later.